Let's get started again. I think it was very interesting on artificial intelligence and ma machine learning. Uh, and it was a, a, a very interesting warm up with uh, also, I, th I thought, a very interesting Q&A session. Now we are moving to the next step on FinTech and what is going to happen. And let me introduce you to Professor Caselli uh, that is going to moderate the next session. Uh, please, uh, Thank you. Stefano. Thank you, Ricardo. So thank you very much and welcome to everybody. So we have to start the session number two. So we have to go through the concept of business transformation and we have to use the angle of finance, so the angle I love. And I want to share uh, this debate together with two great players and friends. So I would like to invite on the podium uh, Davide Serra, CEO and founder of Algebris. So Davide. <laughs> And Andrea Munari, CEO and Managing Director of BNP Paribas, Italy. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as, as we did in the first session, so first of all, we want to start interacting together, but we want to <coughs> avoid to be a bit boring. So we want to have a lot of interaction from, from the audience. Just to start breaking the ice, I want to just to introduce the topic, because when we talk about, you know, Probably the title of this session was too aggressive, as you mentioned, with or without banks. Sorry, you can't cancel. So it's too Thank much. You. It's my fault. So Thank you. let's change a bit. So we have to discuss about the impact of technology and fintech and digital on the financial industry. So if we try to shape the future in a certain sense, probably we have to talk about two different stories, just to exaggerate a bit the bright side of the story and the dark side. Uh, if you talk about the bright side of the story, the issue is to try to understand in which way technology is going to affect the business of finance and the business of banking. It's very difficult to say that the impact will be as a whole. Probably we need to differentiate the impact considering the different industries of the banking sector, not only the front and the back office, but retail banking probably is one story and corporate lending is another one, asset management is another one again, and probably the impact of technology and also the presence of new competitors could be completely different. But there is also the dark side of the story where the dark side is related to issues like crypto assets or ICOs, so the new wave, if I may say, of IPOs, so it's in a certain sense is the dark side of the story, which is a crossroad of many, I may say also, illegal transactions. But it's very difficult so, to exactly understand what is this dark side of the story, because also the bright side is very interesting in, the, in this area. For example, if I consider the, the, the Central Bank of Uruguay and uh, Sweden, they decided to introduce a e-peso and a e-krona, and why the e-peso is exactly a digital currency. So the Central Bank of Uruguay launched basically an experiment in Uruguay last year. But on the contrary, e will be delivered using the blockchain technology. So the dark side could become bright in a, in, in a certain sense. But I want to stop and I want to start with some question. Let's start with, with Davide. So the, the first question is related to, you know, try to understand what could be the impact on the playing field of banks, financial industries? So if you consider technology and financial industry, so it's a very, you know, it's really the elephant in the room. But let's try, you know, to figure out what could be the impact, you know, of technology uh, using, obviously, your view and your angle. Thank you, Davide. <clears throat> so I think, uh, thank you, Stefano. First, I would say, if you look at banking and insurance as an industry, has the lowest Gini coefficient in the world of any other industry. So take pharma, 10 company, 50% market share. Take oil, 10 company, 50% of your reserves. Take technology, even more concentrated. You take banking, you take the top 10 banks have less than 5% of global deposits or global assets. So the first comment is, it's the most fragmented industry in the world, and there is a reason, is because it performs maturity transformation from your own deposits today into the future and is regulated by central banks. So 
to be pragmatic today, uh, cash coin physical assets are less than 1% of global wealth. So 99% is already crypto. Yep, crypto meaning it's, it's on a server. Secondly, as um, the allocation of capital and, and uh, deposits, reserves, which is ultimately the function of the banking industry, which has been delegated by the central bank to private actors simply because it's typically a better uh, allocator of capital because every time we went on the public model, it blew up. What happens is you need efficient data analysis to take decisions. And what happens is finance costs are rising as percentage of total cost. And as a result, uh, the evolution of uh, technology is key. And banking, long way to go. But we are starting from a huge advantage point, in my view. You take IBM, take Oracle, 40% of their sales is to financial institutions. So there is no technology company without a bank that is actually buying that technology. We have the largest customer globally, bigger than governments. Okay, so just to start. Secondly, they live uh, typically in the Stone Age. Why? It's very hard to transform an industry where you need to keep on going and you have millions of people with their own current account. Yeah, because you can basically work during weekends and you only have 52 weekends per year to do the transformation. You can't say, hold on a second, I'm gonna switch off a new system. Yeah, it's a bit like a telco. You know, imagine if a telco was to switch off the, the network. You can't. Um, having said so, I do believe that uh, the technology will have a massive impact because there are so many tasks which right now are done by humans that tomorrow can be done by machine in a better way, more efficient. And as you had transformation, think about the first ATM being introduced 40 years ago, yeah? The start uh, replacing cashier. So you're gonna have uh, technology advancing and creating economy of scale. Because for the first time in history, you actually have economy of scale kicking in in the banking industry, which is why the Gini coefficient is rising because consolidation is happening. And it's happening also because uh, from the regulatory perspective, the central banks have set up two lists of financial institutions. There is one list that is called Global Systemically Important Financial Institution. These are the 65 most important and relevant financial institutions in the world. They require more capital, more regulation, uh, more stress, uh, senior management regime. They are criminally liable. Yep, for their mistakes. I it's need the only to need drink something, it's okay. better, right? So and that's <laughs> the right. list. And then there is anybody else. Andrea, if you want to jump, I have well, another question, I, but I feel free to jump. Just, so. um, uh, he's right. You know, <laughs> really, we are always at the Democrat's world of regulators and so on. But I think that uh, to put uh, in a little bit in the context, uh, we are, if I can use geometry, we have three vectors we are uh, dealing with. One is a massive uh, regulation uh, um, initiatives. Uh, two, an economic cycle that in the last 10 years has been, to say the least, challenging. And three, a phenomenal uh, technological disruption. And so a very challenging uh, um, uh, new way of uh, running the business. So Davide is right to say that eventually to cope with this three, at the, with three vector at the same time, one of the logic outcomes should be uh, consolidation. Uh, but it's not really happening, or it's not nap happening the way we would expect, and with the speed we would expect. Now, in the history, clearly I I'm, I'm was really a bad student in Bocconi, but uh, um, I remember only three industries who face uh, this sort of, uh, one at least one of these vectors. One was the oil industry after Exxon Valdez with a massive regulatory impact. Um, the second one uh, has been uh, telco, which is, to say, well liberalized. And third is us. The only f problem is that the other two, the first two, didn't have to deal in the same time with three vectors, but just with one. And most importantly, all the two, both um, oil industry, oil companies, and uh, telco were making still an enormous amount of money. We are not. We are 
facing, we have depleted an immense amount of capital because our cost of capital has been remarkably higher than our return on capital, which is my personal nightmare. If I wake up, the only thing I think about is how can I improve my ROE? Um, so uh, what I'm saying now is that uh, um, the last problem, last but not least, is that are we sure that becoming bigger is going to solve the situation? Uh, there is a famous study of the Federal Reserve, I think, in 1994, uh, which said, do we really need big banks? And it was demonstrated it was not. But maybe now something has changed. From, it's 24 years after. Yeah. Regulators are somehow remarkably reluctant to concede this. Um, and in Europe, frankly, um, we personally, as Ben Peparibá, uh, we have been pretty pretty outspoken on this. We don't see any value at the moment in doing cross-country cross um, merge and consolidation. There are still room in every single country, because at the end of the day, first you need to have uh, to create a, an enormous consolidation, much uh, bigger consolidation in certain countries. France is already at a certain level, so it's game over. Germany is an open field. Italy, well, uh, is still, a, a, but it's getting better. Spain is already, but there is where I see coming the consolidation. I want to come back to you with another question. David, just to react to what uh, Andrea mentioned, what you mentioned before. So in this, you know, landscape in which you have global institutions and medium and small player and local players, as we have, for example, in Italy, but not only in Italy, also in, in Germany, how do you see uh, the future we uh, listen that the future is not predictable uh, coming from the first session, but let's try to, to say something about you know, this competition between large institutions yeah. and small ones. So um, I'll start from the uh, technology point of view. So today, as citizen in Europe, banks pay 40% of the corporate tax bill. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google pay nothing, OK? So, First, you can't have two industries competing when one is the biggest tax cheater on the planet, thanks to the European Union, Luxembourg, Ireland, and the Netherlands uh, status. So we have the biggest uh, tax havens in Europe. And everybody else locally pays huge amounts of taxes. Secondly, you have then to add the second uh, overlay, which is China vis-a-vis -vis US. So in China, they haven't let any US services get in. So what happens, they develop their own player. So they just came up with Ant Financial out of Alibaba, around $150 billion. It's worth more than any European bank. And they only set it up the last 10 years. So far, it's totally protected. Get access throughout Chinese consumer, has the government sitting on it, backed by the PBOC. If I take on the other side, the two largest, most valuable uh, companies in the world, Amazon and Google, they're getting to a market cap around one trillion, where eventually uh, they would love to get into finance using data. Now, as soon as these corporations were to actually perform banking activity outside China, because that's where the world cannot compete so far, I think they will fall into the regulatory net, as they should. And if they do, it's game over for them. Two, so what happens is it's up to European and US player to keep on re uh, reinventing their own processes and understand where technology can actually help you to solve the basic task quicker, faster, smarter. And that has also social implication uh, for the simple reason that in any country, the banking industry employs about 5 to 6% of staff, which probably won't be required in the future. Now, if I look at a data, though, which is very interesting to me, I always look as an investor, value, market capitalization, divided by number of people, how many bloody people you have in your organization, yeah? As a, as a basically proxy for goodwill. Apple and Google, sorry, I take Apple and Google, yep, 
they're worth about eight, nine million dollar per employee. They only pay 4% tax rate globally. In the US now, with the changes in legislation globally, I hope they're gonna end up paying slightly higher because they're gonna repatriate foreign cash. Well, let's say they pay 6% tax rate. So if you were to tax, if you were to pay taxes fairly, assuming Bruno Le Maire and Macron gets their way, that number will probably be five to six million dollars. Then you take Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. They're worth two to three million dollars per person. You take a BNP Paribas, it's worth five hundred thousand dollars per person. They have lots of retail banking activity, consumer lower activity. You take then Blackstone, which is the largest investor in the world, it's $20 million per person. You take BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, is worth eight, nine million dollars per person. Hence, my view is, from the finance vis-a-vis -vis banking and investing, is still attracting, so far, the highest level of human capital, and it's, you can see it from how much they're actually worth, divided how many people work in it. And I think it will be interesting the battle whether man or machine win. I think men always win. And what will happen in banking is smart men will understand how to use technology at their advantage and disrupt other men who are not using technology at their own advantage. Happened in the history of military, yeah? If you had a, a better gun, yeah? They could shoot faster, you'd win a war. If you have better science, and this is what's happening uh, from the industrial perspective. Andrea, or oh, please, can you reply? Or I have a no, I very huge <coughs> question I, related I, I, to... Um, I think, first of all, um, if I look, it's true, uh, I must agree with, with, um, with Davide. Uh, but I, I, will, um, I would also underline a couple of points that maybe could be of interest uh, uh, in the way we see the competition coming from uh, the GAFAM in general. Um, clearly, we are upsetting competition. It's, we cannot uh, try to protect ourselves. This is ridiculous, eventually. But what uh, I think is uh, gradually uh, gaining momentum is that the fact that they, this GAFA in general have a, a common characteristic. They effectively don't care about risk. For them, risk is absolutely a non-variable, meaning that uh, uh, if you think about what happened with Yahoo, which they lost uh, nearly a billion uh, accounts, uh, that they got probably 200 million fine. From if it happened to my bank that we lose 30,000 uh, uh, accounts data, I will have a Chinook uh, surrounding my building of people immediately stopping our activity. So they have been remarkably, remarkably slower in uh, reacting to this sort of, of issue. And the, the, the recent events at Facebook, uh, with Facebook and so on, let me say, are the tip of the iceberg. Uh, because the issue is much more complex. They have not really focused on this, and eventually, if they want to run a serious business, at least with the current regulation, um, provided that uh, regulator himself uh, think that the incumbents should be uh, better off uh, in, uh, in getting into this market, I think we will face an enormous problem. As the other problem which we start thinking uh, will, uh, will arise is all the operational risk. Uh, which right. remains something uh, obscure, in the, whereas we have to uh, immediately to identify, it's not clear how they, how they do it. So to me, uh, this is one point that uh, is going to pervade uh, the debate and their decision to do it or not to do. I, I want to elaborate a bit more on that. Using your viewpoint of large institution, on the one hand, it's interesting to understand in which way technology is going to affect all the processes. You know, but on the other hand, and we talk a lot about that, there is still a technological gap into the, the, the banking system. How do you see, uh, how do you manage you know, this technological gap and this storm, if I may say, affecting everything? I don't think that um, there is a, let me be very, very open to this. I don't think that there is a technological gap uh, what we have at the moment, uh, for example, vis-a-vis -vis fintech, uh, maybe I'm 
I'm exaggerating, but I think that the success of fintech is uh, inversely proportionate to the legacy that banks have to deal with. Um, we have an enormous amount of uh, legacy assets, which can be that of clients, uh, or that we need to handle because we cannot really simply unwind or, or destroy it. So there is a sort at the moment of, uh, I wouldn't say fight, but attempts to really manage a gradual digitalization, gradual, as fast as you can, digitization of, uh, of our activity uh, towards with a, an analogic heritage that we have to deal with. And this, you can really see it very clearly um, when uh, you talk to provider of infrastructure. Because provider of infrastructure now are all focusing on the digital uh, market, and they seem to be less uh, I would say focus how to, de how to deal with uh, the analogical. So all the infrastructure, the Cisco of the situation, we were, is right, David is right, but is, let me say, David, you are this time two years behind the curve because these guys now are effectively not focusing anymore on us, on the banks, we have been the best clients of them, rather on the Amazon, the Cisco, the, the Google, uh, the Apple of the situation because they are the one who are really taking advantage of this new, of this new time. But um, just to to say to David that it's true, we are coming from the same institution, by the way. Um, at the end of the day, what I say normally when I have to hire uh, particularly young people, I say, it's too easy to work at Amazon, too easy to work at Google, too easy to work at Blackstone, because everything goes fine there. You want a real challenge? You want a, everything goes very bad? Come to a, come here, and you have a phenomenal opportunity to so test yourself. So it's a recruiting session, so we are recruiting people. <laughs> so it's a call for, so exactly. do, do, do you want to enter the, the dark side, as I mentioned before, so Davide, so when we talk about crypto assets, so it's very interesting to uh, elaborate a bit on that because, you know, there is a, a lack of knowledge in the market, so everybody basically talks about crypto assets. But it's very difficult to understand. So how do you see, you know, the story of crypto assets in yes. terms of pros and cons? And yeah. So I've done a lot of work on it. Uh, and I share my work with uh, Nuriel Rubini, who's a personal friend and is very vocal. So uh, blockchain distributed ledger two. it's a very interesting technology. So far, basically, let's be pragmatic. Uh, you're JP Morgan. I'm a Fed and uh, you are BNP. So far, the system has been working that each of us was working their own firewall. Mainframe, IT, <coughs> physical, and we all were storing our information, we were accountable for them, and the transaction were done bank by bank, or clearing with a central bank, one by one. Clearly, this requires massive amount of cost we're duplicating. Having said so, every institution where to fail to protect their own customer data will be shut down immediately. So what happened to Facebook, um, what happened to Yahoo, had it happened to a bank, they would have been intervened and sent to zero in one second. Okay? So you can't run that risk. Now, the idea that tomorrow we can take down these defenses inside private networks. So first, we know who you are. Secondly, when we know who you are because you've been certified, like it happens in capital markets, we can interact among us without the requirement of having this massive costly infrastructure to each protect our own data inside the ecosystem. Great, it will have legs, it's at the beginning, it will work. Blockchain distributed ledger technology to private networks. Then there is something that is a total scam that's crypto assets on public uh, network. <coughs> Meaning, I don't know who the hell you are. Yeah, you can be a drug dealer in Venezuela. You can be a dark guy from North Korea, public. They use this mining concept. So basically, burn electricity to calculate weird algorithm, cost of fortune. Nobody knows your identity. And what we do fundamentally is money laundering because no one needs to have a form of payment where nobody knows who's the other person, cost of future to run it, 
There is zero intrinsic value behind it. When we went from gold to fiat currency, what fiat currency is, it's the net present value of the cash flow that a country which prints paper can actually have. How do you enforce your net present value? Legal system, military, and rule of law. Yeah? So you pay taxes within a certain law. And whoever is in that country, that's your cash flow stream. So think as currency as nothing else but the number of share of one company, company being the state. Who would keep his own saving in something that has no rule of law, no military, you don't know who you're dealing with? Now, black economy, take total GDP is 80 trillion. Black economy, it's 5% at least. So you're talking about 4 trillion. And crypto assets are only 300 billion today. So let's say less than 10% of all uh, black economy transactions are dealt using crypto assets. Um, a very interesting analogy is that if you look at the Gini coefficient of who owns crypto assets, it's more concentrated the wealth than in North Korea. It's the highest <laughs> coefficient. So it's not distributed, it's not public, it's a massive scam. The reason why regulators haven't intervened is because these guys were smart and they call it a currency. So tomorrow, I, I sail the world, and I've been in a few islands close to Papua New Guinea where they've never seen white men, I never realized it, and their own currency is coconuts. Within the island, they exchange with coconuts nuts. Absolutely fine. You call it a currency, it's not an investment product. So what happens is no regulator globally have intervened so far. Because this is the biggest Ponzi scam on the planet, only used fundamentally by other stupid, but you know, get money stolen by Froster, uh, I think the SEC will soon shut down a couple of exchanges, and I'm guaranteed few people will go to jail. At that point, I think the big scam of the advertising revenue on Google and Facebook will disappear, and hence pure uh, savers, which have no idea and were cheated, uh, will disappear. Today, there is about, each day, you have about four, five trillion dollars that moves around the world, and it's all crypto, using the JP Morgan, Fed, BNP example. So, and it's way, way more efficient. To give an idea, Bitcoin can execute less than 100 transactions per second. We are trading in markets at velocity which is in the range of uh, 30 million transactions per second at no cost. Hence, it's just a, it's a scam. And because people don't understand it and they saw the price going up, they've been buying it. Fundamental value, lower than zero. Why? To keep it running, it costs a fortune. And hence, it doesn't even have terminal value, which is uh, positive. I, <clears throat> I completely agree with, uh, very briefly, with what uh, David is saying. Um, I add only one thing, that uh, the blockchain technology is a technology which we are studying because we like it, and eventually should actually be announced. And I think uh, that, in fact, uh, it solves also two he solved another problem that uh, David had just touched it, which is he reduced massively the operational risk, massively, because the risk of transacting uh, whatever is the asset that drops uh, to a level really close to zero. Um, that is point number one. Point number two, it would probably, it would probably help uh, the consolidation of the, of the industry, because at that point, effectively, one of the most important area, which is all, uh, uh, transaction banking itself of uh, volumes, flows, processes, people, uh, machine, uh, of course, will drop significantly, but will be much easier also to, to merge. Another question, uh, it, it's related to something which is very, very glamour today related to the banking system. So uh, the booming of a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform that seems, you know, especially in the United States, I don't want to say they are facing a decline. I'm exaggerating a bit, but in Europe there is, you know, this new rise of, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. H how do you see this? This story can be 
competitors or alternative, or you can buy it and to, you know, what is your approach to this kind of player? <clears throat> I try to, to answer very, very quickly. Um, when you land today in this landing environment, uh, um, there are two major uh, variables you look at. Um, speed and uh, so how, and uh, uh, really who are way to land uh, um, to people who hopefully will reimburse you. Um, the two things have some sort of correlation. Um, we have, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, we, we don't consider this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending uh, platform uh, a sort of uh, a threat because we are effectively dealing with the same sort of logic. But it's true that um, um, the biggest difference we see with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platform is that, uh, and probably they have an advantage, in the algorithm they use to evaluate the credit they are uh, inputting a, a number of uh, variables, which probably are not completely backtest and so on, but where, thanks to IE, uh, machine learning, and uh, really velocity in, in, uh, in handling an immense amount of data, they can somehow have a sort of rating of a people, company you want to land with, uh, which can be very efficient. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, clearly, regulators have a say on that, because when we start landing with different kind of uh, methodology, um, it can be it can be challenged. Uh, but in a way, so they are, somehow they gave us uh, a, um, a sort of hint. Uh, they were a trigger to redefine completely our lending model. Um, personally, I think that uh, you can uh, get advantage of it. So the idea we are, for example, in BNL we are using already, because we can give money effectively now in 15 minutes if we want to. Of course, risk management is not so happy to do that, but uh, uh, what we are trying to do now is to convince them of the steadiness of this uh, project, but it takes some time to get it. And clearly, clearly, um, what is important even on uh, speed and, uh, uh, and uh, the, eff the effectiveness of, the, of this lending model uh, of rating, is that you need an enormous capacity of managing data. Um, so you need to have a process of lending which are, you, banks are de facto, from my standpoint, have two things, processes and people. Technology is a sort of, uh, I would say, um, a third invited. But at the end of the day, uh, we need to robotize. We are already robotizing most of these processes to speed up. The question is, uh, which uh, I heard the CEO of, uh, of Vodafone before, which we are facing more or less, from what I understood, the same, uh, the same issues. But one of the uh, problems we are facing is that banks, in general, have been vertical organization. When you go to digital, you need to be transversal, literally horizontal. And when you start to robotize, to use uh, RPAs, Normally, RPAs, the first use you have is in operation and so on. But that uh, is clearly getting an enormous uh, uh, save of uh, money, people, and so on. So you, are, you can become very effective. But it adds an enormous uh, amount of rigidity in the system, meaning that when you start robotizing something, you have a sort of chain of uh, chain reaction that you need always to monitor. So the idea we have is really to work on end-to-end uh, -end processes. So to build up all what they are called customer journey, customer experience, which really start from the moment the client goes to, to the bank or contact you via digital, and then he has at the end uh, the confirmation that what he has asked for has been executed. This is an enormous challenge. It requires uh, an enormous infrastructure, enormous computing um, power. And last but not least, I comment on the previous. Uh, um, I think that uh, I am uh, remarkably uh, sure about this. And this is something that also for the academy is very important. Um, first, um, we are lacking academic research, enough academic research on what is happening now. We don't have enough, literally, research to see what we are going to face. 
Uh, in US now it start uh, to see something coming out, but this is very important. Why I say this? Because eventually uh, you, will, uh, you will need to continue to update your, uh, your workforce yourself. I spend one hour a day reading something completely different from, uh, from banking. Because you need really to try, uh, and try, of course, very humbly, to understand what's going on. But the other important thing is that, um, of course, I am 55 now, 50, uh, so I need to, uh, <laughs> to speak in favor of my generation. Not necessarily being uh, uh, old um, is, uh, is really a, a problem, can be an obstacle. Of course, you need to challenge yourself. But what I was saying is that it's absolutely wrong to think that people coming out from academia will have an enormous, uh, I would say, uh, motorway to run with. Because the span of uh, what I call, what I define as the span of freedom. So how long, for how long you will, have, you will have an advantage vis a vis the people are already in the workforce for me. To me, now is around four years, but it will go to two, two and a half years. We are using technology now, has been named Siri and so on, which are 20 years ago. Now, what is coming next, we don't even know. So we need to have a, a much better understanding of this and be ready to really rechallenge ourselves. Thank you. I don't know, David, if you want to reply, otherwise I would like to open you know, Q&A from the audience. I just say on peer-to-peer -peer lending, so right. we made money shorting all of them for a simple reason. First, 2011, you have the banking crisis. So lots of people lost their jobs. 2009 and 11. And lots of them were risk manager because they weren't managing any risk. And so what I've realized is these guys, they all got together in California. And or to the central banks. In few central banks. We're not going to comment on central <laughs> banks. They have our regulators. We're conflicted. And so what happened then, they had flood of money being raised in venture. And let's be clear the business of banking. Uh, we are 300 people here. So banking is, you make two of margin. So I give you 100. Each year, you pay me two. So it takes 50 years to pay me back interest only. And if only each year, two out of 100 don't pay me back, I'm at a loss. Okay? Now, we are 300 here. That basically means six of you don't pay me back, assuming I lent you money equally and it's a loss-making business. Even if we're all Bocconi graduates here, it's not a great business, to be clear. And we're probably one of the highest courts yeah, you can think of. So first of all, it's not a super business. Yeah? Numbers are against you. Secondly, so what happened with this peer-to-peer -peer lending? The platform, so the guy that does not take any risk, said, hey, because interest rates are very low and investors are starving for yield because of central bank intervention, why don't I go a promise, a return, which is untested? So I'm running someone else's risk, money. Yeah? So Andrea is taking his cash, giving his money, he's at risk. I'm the platform. I have failed risk manager, I put a couple of IT, and I lend where no banks can lend because of regulation. Because they deem too risky. So the regulator said you can't lend there, it's too risky. So they went in the ultra high risk. Why? As a bank today, you're borrowing at zero or in Europe at minus 40 basis point. So what you're actually lending, you're making money out of it. Yeah? So you're taking commodity, and the central bank pays you to lend it. If you are a peer-to-peer -peer platform, you need to pay it 5 6%. So 10, 15 times more. And hence, there is no way that this guy can actually compete. Now, next credit cycle, there will be so many people losing money on peer-to-peer -peer lending, that will not even be funny. You just take one recession. and so. What we have done is, as soon as these guys came out, waited for the frenzy to price uh, the future, and then shorted the credit tranches, and just wait the next recession. Thank you, thank you, Andrea, thank you. Davide, let's start you know, to collect questions from the audience. We have a mic there, and the first question is there. If you want to introduce yourself, it's great. Uh, uh, for the GDPR, I prefer to stay anonymous. OK, don't worry. It's OK. <laughs> Choose a, what you want. It's great. Question, I have a question for uh, Mr. Serra. Uh, my friends in uh, Wall Street and um, 
city, they are, they are, they are um, escaping from investment banking. Uh, the crisis, uh, Lehman Brothers crisis, left a bad reputation. To, to say that you have a background in investment banking is really, really bad now. And so they are moving to PayPal or their online uh, uh, platforms uh, because there's moral issues over there, uh, there's innovation. You are the incumbents, and you are uh, using regulation to protect your margins. It's not true that uh, you are not making money, because all the banks and intermediaries are making 25% margin, profit margin, uh, on average, at least in South Korea, I don't know, uh, maybe in Italy. And uh, when you say that um, uh, oil industry, telco, I think that uh, you should have a look at news, media, and um, music industry. Because music industry was disrupted very fast in a way that probably you will see happening much faster than you think. Because uh, uh, blockchain uh, is solving a huge issue, which is decentralization. And intermediaries, intermediaries are not necessary anymore because uh, money can be moved from who has the money to who need the money at zero commissions. And you are there taking commissions for, for things because people are not knowledgeable about finance. You're not giving any value proposition to your customer at the moment. Fine. But, uh, you ask. <laughs> <clears throat> no, so I think that uh, I have no problem with GDPR here uh, to say. Um, I think that uh, what I wanted to say regarding the oil industry and telco industry was at the time they faced a really strong shock. They had to work only on one. Uh, bank is true. I think that you are right in saying that banks have been, uh, uh, particularly in Europe, <coughs> and in part even in the United States, where in the United States the market is much more concentrated, so the margins are much higher uh, than uh, in our jurisdiction. Uh, but it's true that uh, banks were not used to, uh, to deal uh, or to live in a competitive uh, environment. This has changed uh, quite dramatically, and this is where we are effectively um, be challenged. What I reckon, we are pretty sure, uh, I would love to have 25% of, uh, of margin myself, but it's not. But what we know for sure is that uh, on some area, on some businesses, which have been a sort of cash cow, uh, we will not get any money anymore. Digital payments in general, uh, payments where we had an enormous profit in general as a bank are going to disappear. It's just a question of timing, but it's running very, very fast. So from my standpoint, if our market cap will reflect that, I will have a problem because, in fact, uh, I think that there will, no be, will not be any kind of uh, real margin there. But, but we know that is happening. We are trying to cope with this, selling different kind of services uh, uh, and gaining commission on something which can be useful uh, to our clients, to our customer, to take better decisions. In a way, uh, I would say that uh, our mission now is really to make sure that the financial beings of our, of, of our clients uh, is getting better. That is, I would say, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do. But I accept uh, what you are saying, that uh, there is going to be a continuous challenge on this, which is also what I said, the beauty. You are really facing uh, a massive competition. You have to cope on that. There is one item well, that is unique of the banking industry that no other industry has. You have already sold the future. So I step back. If you're Apple, I have my iPad. If you're Amazon, which I love, I order my product today. In banking, made 100 the wealth, cash, of human being, we have already lent out 350 to 400, okay? It's called mortgage. It's called infrastructure investment. It's called life insurance. Yep. So while in media news, any in industry, pharma, yeah, you go and buy your product, you haven't already bought the product for the next 10 years. In banking, there is something unique, which is why it's under ultra straight regulation. And while any other industry can de facto fail, 
and you keep democracy going. When you have a banking failure, democracy goes. Military close and size border. Always they did in history. So if tomorrow Facebook doesn't work, nobody, nothing happens to the world. Actually, the world is a better place. <laughs> if tomorrow you have uh, one of the 60 most important financial institutions but closest, you have a Lehman Brothers event. You create 50 million unemployed people. And hence, that's the reason why you have, in my view, a defendable profit margin. By the way, it's, the average bank is operating on a 0.7 return on asset. The average industry operates on 7% return on asset. And then, because it has a 15 times leverage, it makes the same return on equity. So let's be clear, the last area where I think you can go and easily take, suck out margin, it's banking. And why? Because it's one of the oldest industries in the world. And so this idea that new entrants can easily come in on numbers, I haven't seen it yet. And G, I think, is the key test. General Electric, there's only three tickers on the blue board that are more than 100 years old. Yeah? IBM, G. G did one thing, had an activity that was regulated, immediately spun it off. And so this will apply also to anybody else, ex-China. Because in China, they have realized that to compete with the US, they need to get the Amazon and, let's say, Google together. So they're getting Alibaba with Ant Financial to then make it so strong that tomorrow can compete as a bank and the platform together. Well, in the US, they can't because they're under regulatory framework. I think at Weber, <coughs> what, we, what is happening now is that the regulators are asking us to have much more capital than we used to have. So we cannot leverage anymore, de facto, or the way we used to, uh, to do it. So de facto, uh, ourselves, you just look at the numbers, we were making the same amount of money we are making today with half the capital. So that is really, we have to double the capital in order to make the same amount of money. But uh, most importantly, I think at the obvious consequence, or at least obvious for most of the rational people, is that you cannot pretend anymore that banks lend uh, to leverage, to lever too much leverage uh, clients. That right. is the other point. So I think we are going gradually to a sort of, uh, hopefully, less leverage economy so that we will be able to face even bank failure much more easily than, uh, than in the past. Question there, there, and there, and there. So probably you can collect the three questions and to reply. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the financial industry has been highly regulated after the financial crisis. Um, returns on assets has gone down. So uh, that seems to me that a lot of management in the financial industry has gone to the regulators. So lots of business has been externalized. And uh, what, what's your take on this point and uh, uh, about the parallelism between this and the uh, concept of public banking? Public. 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 Ah, public okay. banking. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Question there and the question there. Thank you for the mic. Uh, I, have a I have a question to Mr. Munari. Um, a question about banking and digital community. Recently, Kakao, the mo biggest social network in uh, Korea, launched its new bank, uh, attracting in just four days uh, uh, one million clients and $500 million in deposit. So what is the role of uh, the banks with this digital community and how they can leverage it in order to disrupt the industry instead of being disrupted? And the third question there. There. So we spoke up. We spoke about consolidation momentum in the banking system as a mitigant um, to try to, let's say, proceed in the digitalization process. 
when a bank doesn't have uh, enough resources uh, to go through it. But as, uh, as we know in finance, uh, consolidation requires time to implement strategies. And my question is, uh, um, can we say that big tech companies are a, a threat in, um, as they could take uh, or gain the part of market share that the other banks will lose while they have to, to consolidate each other to go ahead in this process of digitalization? So the three questions on the table. Andre and Davide. So I think one on margins. So um, for you to understand margins long term, Rome, annus zero, 100 million people on planet Earth, 2 million people in Rome. So it's like today having a city of 150 million people. That's why we say you know, all roads lead to Rome. First 1 billion people on planet Earth, 1,800. Today we're 7. Billion. In the next 30 years, we are adding 1 billion each. So it took 3 to 4 million years to make the first billion people on the planet, and now we're adding 3 in the next 30 years. That leads to two numbers, war or inflation. One of the two. I hope it's only inflation and not war. But on, if you look at long-term study, uh, these two extra billion people are going to be between India, Pakistan, and China, Kashmir. And they're all of them nuclear power. So the probability there are half a billion people dying out of starvation is high. Now, why do I say this? Because if you look at the last 2,000 years average interest rate calculated on barter to beginning, down to when we had the proper central bank, the average is 18%, 1.8. Since I was born in 71, the average global interest rate, 14. Average interest rate today, global, G20, 1%. Okay? Now, if you are in finance and you are 15 times leverage, a portion of your interest rate is like if Apple were to sell its iPhone at a loss. Hard to make revenue. Now, this won't last. Because what is not normal in 2,000 years history is to have interest rate at one. So, and hence, that's the reason why I think for the next five, 10 years, what I think will happen is the share of profits that finance absorb out of the economy will rise vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the valuation of some of these technology <coughs> companies. And also because they lasted, you know, take BNP, 175 years, never lost money. One quarter. Yeah, but <coughs> year end. <laughs> year end. <laughs> because of regulators. <laughs> but year end. So annual report, 175 years, never lost. First World War, Second World War, <laughs> Spanish influenza. Please, Davide, please, stop it. Stop it here. So stop it here. I'm simply saying stop I would love there. to see some business models being tested through 200 years, yeah? It's too easy to take whatever happened. So I'm pro looking at the longevity and the resilience has to be through hard times, too. Um, and that's my comment on margins. Uh, I can add on. Um, on what was saying regarding uh, uh, this newcomer in general, how they are competing with us. Um, let, let me put in this way, I can give you my experience and what we are trying to, to, to do. Uh, in a nutshell, um, what we are trying to achieve as BNP, but I would say so BNP, BNL, or the group, and uh, I would say that even our competitors probably are trying more or less to do this with some difference, which will make me relating to the, the last question was made. Um, we don't pretend to be the best digital bank in the world. Uh, what we try to achieve is to, gra to give the best digital experience to our clients. That is how we're going to do. And in doing so, effectively, we are not telling the clients what he has to do. We are giving him a sort of option to effectively choose which kind of banking model they want to achieve. And I'll give you an example. In France here, we have this Comnicel. Comnicel is a phenomenal uh, 
uh, is a phenomenal bank which effectively guarantees for 20 euro a debit card linked to an account. You can open uh, via the tobacco shops and so on. We got, uh, I think now we are reaching one million accounts and uh, every month or two months with 100,000 more accounts opening. I will open myself this because it's very simple. For certain kind of uh, services, 20 euro. Uh, then of course, you have clients who need a mortgage, clients who need an advice and so on. And you have to effectively uh, be able to get uh, for different kind of uh, uh, requests by clients, different kind of, of business model. That is how we are, we are trying to think of ourselves and how to, if you want, hopefully to give uh, the best digital experience to clients. Of course, the contact with clients will remain at certain level where they need a specific advice, they want to do certain kind of, uh, of activity, but in reality, uh, this will be spread uh, across, uh, across different kind of, of banking. Um, how I see going forward is that uh, not all the banks will have, uh, as of today, capacity to face uh, this sort of investment, because even investing in business model is remarkably expensive. Um, the group uh, is, public, is a public news, is going to spend, not to invest, so OPEX, not CAPEX, 3 billion euro to transform ourselves digitally, which is an enormous amount of money, enormous. And let me tell you, for what I'm handling myself uh, uh, between BNL and the group in Italy, this is something which concerns me. And I'll tell you why, because uh, when we started doing this program, it was the beginning of seven, 2017, we decided certain kind of, uh, of um, investment, investment, sorry, expenditure, expenditure. Uh, expenditure. And if you ask me today, mid of 2018, would you do the same uh, um, sort of expenditure? Of course, I have to say yes, otherwise I will be, but for sure, uh, the timing of the priorities of the expenditure across the three will be completely different, completely different. So the challenge here is remarkable, and uh, we think we have uh, somehow the shoulder to um, absorb this, also these mistakes, but it's, ex it's an extremely, uh, I would say, Tight, uh, tight path you have to do. So eventually, some banks will gradually um, deplete themselves in, in, so, in this sort of uh, chase to get, uh, to get competitive. The question is how the consolidation will arrive, but here there are a lot of teachers who can tell us how we do, because I think it cannot happen via <coughs> a systemic crisis. It will be an unwinding of, uh, of activity. And uh, it has to be done like this, otherwise uh, it could become, again, a, a very tough exercise like we, we have in Italy, for example, in 2015-16. Let's hope so. And we have room just for the last question. Yeah, or let's try to combine two questions, but very, you know, quick. Okay, maybe. There and there. It's a comment and then a question. The first one is about, uh, I need to react to the comment on the pharmaceutical industry that uh, they sell the drugs only once they are produced. Um, maybe you don't know, but uh, uh, to develop a drug it costs uh, three billions, and it takes 15 years to develop one drug. And you don't know if uh, then the drug is going to be successful. So other industry, they have a lot of pre-investment because of the R&D. There's something maybe is not uh, common in the, in, the, in the financial industry. Then the question is uh, mergers going forward. Um, I think that uh, you have to go through some mergers going forward. Uh, the challenge is why they are not happening. Is it because it's difficult to, to assess what's the value of a bank. I mean, the value of companies based on the net present value going forward, and the net present value is driven by what, are your, what is your future pipeline. Uh, I wonder if uh, it's difficult to assess what's the price of, of a bank, then therefore it's impossible. Without, without that, it's impossible to go through mergers. Thank you. And the other question there, there was a question there. Is there on this side? It's a bit related, so it's, it's fine. Um, we talked about, for example, blockchain and our technology that are now common to all the players. So before, as you were saying, 
each a player had their own infrastructure and now we kind of have a common infrastructure. So I see here a lot of parallel, for example, with the energy sector, where we have the same infrastructure and a lot of players playing on it. So who's going in the end to actually operate this common infrastructure? And um, in some way, um, and this relates to your last comment, that uh, you have lots of OPEX to do it, but basically you have to invest, not really to make more money, but to survive. So will you somehow manage to pass over this cost to the fintechs, which will be ultimately the layer between the customers and the banks? And the very last there, and it's really the last one, is there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So my question is, uh, do you take into account the evolution of uh, consumer behavior and needs? Great, so we have two minutes and five seconds before the lunch, so uh, the task is yours. So for, um, regarding pharmaceutical, of course I know the long in, uh, investment cycle. Pharmaceutical, you can think about a rocket, you can think about uh, you know, creating a bridge. The difference is, in no other industry today, you have already sold three times what you don't have. Yeah? So that's the key, because no pharmaceutical has already sold three times the future sales of whatever drug. They haven't actually sold anything. They need to spend, invest for 15 years to then sell. In banking is cash flow the other way around. Day one, and you've already sold three times what you have. Secondly, that's the reason why in a way it's hard to value. One is called gearing. Uh, you have one of equity, 15 of assets, and 14 of debt. And debt is your cash on your current account. So if you are at any point in cycle, because the assets are real assets only, yeah, it's on the other side of the balance sheet, you only have loans of real estate and corporation. Robots are not borrowing yet, and no Martians have borrowed money. So on the other side, you only have two people, governments, which is nothing but a collect collection of people, corporates, and individuals. And the gearing 15 to 1 means if you're wrong by 1%, you're wrong by 15%, yeah, on the valuation of your assets to equity. So being wrong by 1%, very easy. Well, you're off 15% of the equity value. And third, the reason why they're not merging, because let's assume, if you take and make a car example, if we need to go to a Tesla model, merging uh, uh, Citroën and Peugeot and Fiat, it ain't gonna make a Tesla, yeah? <laughs> you're just gonna make a mess. And uh, today, from a banking perspective, we're ballpark there. Um, and that's why I don't think anything happens short term. Three, four years from now, when people have done the necessary upgrade, I think eventually there will be economy of scale, assuming the market becomes a single market. In the US it's already become, in China already it is. In Europe, we shall see. Today, in BNP Group, their mortgages in Belgium are seen as foreign assets vis-a-vis -vis their own regulator who's in France. They have the Thalys, then in an hour uh, links Brussels to Paris. They speak the same language, but they're seen as foreign assets, and they have different treatment. Till when that happens, there is not a single market. If one market eventually exists in Europe, full banking union deposit guarantee insurance, eventually I think you'll see more consolidation. Uh, I just <clears throat> add one comment here, what um, uh, more uh, I consider, uh, myself more an operational guy. Uh, I had the experience of two mergers. Morgan Stanley with Dean Witter, disastrous. Uh, Intesa with San Paolo, successful. But um, with certain, at the end of the day, the most important thing in banking is to have uh, the culture getting together. Because funnily enough, banks have remark like all the organization probably, but have a remarkable different uh, um, uh, different culture. When we merge uh, Morgan Stanley, it was considered we, we consider ourselves so-called white shoes. Dean Witter were brokers uh, at the end, and uh, <coughs> but uh, the 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 merge was run actually by Dean Witter. And at the time, uh, really, to get the two cultures completely different uh, together um, was a disaster, mostly because eventually it divert uh, the two companies to reinvest where they were very strong. So it's very difficult to do that. 
in Intesa San Paolo, I was at a much higher, let's say, level of, uh, of a management uh, there. Um, it happened that we had uh, um, a remarkable complementarity. Even on risk management, Sao Paulo was very strong in credit risk. Intesa, phenomenally strong in uh, market risk. So the merge was, uh, uh, was done via complementarity, but the most important thing, there was one man in, in command, <laughs> Mr. Passer, and there was only his word against every single else. So merge are remarkably, I would say, bloody um, um, exercise, uh, which impact people, uh, impact uh, the behaviors of people, and impact also the client's behavior. Not necessarily a client is happy about uh, uh, how a merge uh, is conducted. So today, uh, I was thinking how I did two merge not, not, not two without three, so I hope I will not do another one. Um, but uh, um, not because I don't want to, to be challenged, but uh, it's complicated. Uh, but to answer your question, we definitely look at clients' behavior. But most importantly, we look at as much as possible how clients can help us to improve their digital experience. So it was mentioned before, we are using MPS, Net Promoter System, um, which we want actually to transform uh, uh, in Net Promoter Spirit, meaning that across the organization now in BNL, everybody has this number, and they know that this number counts. It convinced me that at a certain stage, the Net Promoter Score System, Spirit as you want to call, uh, is uh, eventually the um, uh, the goal, the objective to, to maximize, because eventually we are pretty sure uh, ROE will improve via that. But it's very important that clients become promoter of you. And in order that clients become promoter to you, you have to do a sort of, let me say, nearly Copernican revolution, for sure it's for BNL, where you have to go to the clients and uh, asking him why he's upset with us and immediately uh, amend what you're doing wrong. We are doing this, remarkably difficult. We know it will take probably five, six years to get in to a level where we consider, uh, I wouldn't say the optimal level, but the cruising, uh, cruising level. But it remains uh, uh, the biggest challenge to understand how uh, client and customer are behaving. We could get till to the gala dinner, but it could be smart to have a lunch. So thank you very much and a big applause for the two speakers.